Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and it's time once again for your weekly ramp up. And this week I thought I would talk a little bit about how hard it is to launch a game console in 2022. I have covered all sorts of attempts to try to disrupt the console market or maybe carve out a budget section of the console market. And no matter the size of the company, every one of these efforts has failed to even make a dent in the gaming industry, yet companies keep trying. The recent one here being the Intellivision Amico, uh, which is on the ropes according to some new financial documents that the company released to potential investors. We've got a lot to talk about now, so let's get to it. Now, if the name Intellivision sounds familiar to you, that's because it's the name of a popular video game console from the 1980s manufactured by Mattel. When Mattel got out of the video game business, they sold the rights to Intellivision to some of the former Intellivision employees, and they in turn sold the rights to others down the road. So the people making this new console have nothing to do with the old one at all, but it did retain the name in the hopes that maybe some 40-somethings out there may remember the brand and have some favorable recognition of it. And I guess there is some brand value to the Intellivision name, but this is an Intellivision in name only. They did try to copy some of the heritage of the old Intellivision. You can see the controllers have that rotary dial similar to what they had on the original console there, but they now have a touch screen, and that's what makes this console really complicated because in addition to having an operating system for the console itself, you got to have one running on the controllers, and those controllers in turn have to communicate with the main console to get everything to work right. And even Nintendo kind of gave up on this concept of a separate OS running on the controller to something a lot simpler. And this is, I think, part of the problem in bringing uh, this console to market and why it's failing. That said, they did take a good number of pre-orders here, about 10,000 last April when they first offered it for sale. And people put up money to buy this, and now they are waiting. And 10,000 might seem like a lot, But compared to the other consoles out there that are going to cost the same or perhaps less than the Amico, uh, you can see here that it is a literal drop in the bucket. Nintendo, for example, has sold 103 million Switch units worldwide. This is now more than the Nintendo Wii that was their last big hit. And if you put that number into perspective as a developer... Even if Intellivision paid you to make an exclusive game for their console, you will likely make more money getting no incentive from Nintendo but having that app live on their eShop just because of the volume of users here. And that's what every one of these startup consoles is up against. You have to be able to figure out some way to deliver something that makes your hardware worth buying because it's going to be very hard to attract developers that have to invest their own time and money to make games for your system. And Intellivision's having trouble just getting this thing manufactured. Uh, They've now experienced their third delay. In fairness, this is likely due to the fact that the pandemic and all the associated hardware shortages have made it really tough for small companies like this to get the parts they need to get into manufacturing. But they've got a very complicated design here that's going to take a lot more than a basic Android console might require for manufacturing. And Intellivision is running out of time and money. They quietly replaced their CEO not that long ago, and now they are desperately running around trying to get some more crowdfunded investments into the company so that they can maybe get to the manufacturing stage of the console development. And if you take a look at their uh, financial disclosure that is required uh, by these crowdfunding platforms and, of course, the United States government, you can see just how bad things are right now for the company. So if we take a look at their income statement, they have racked up $3.2 million in losses in 2020 alone on top of half a million dollars in the prior year. And we don't know what 2021 looked like because 2020 was the latest data that they provided as part of this financial disclosure form, but I would imagine it's not looking pretty here. And they're also in a lot of debt. They owe over eight and a half million dollars at this point. A lot of that to people who have loaned money to the company, uh, along with perhaps the people that pre-ordered the console. And you can see just how much debt they racked up in a year trying to get this thing out to market. 
And again, this is from 2020, not 2021, so I would imagine it would look much worse. Also on the financial disclosure, they revealed how much operating cash they have left. And at the current burn rate, they will be done by July of 2022 if they don't generate any revenue. And think of the challenge they're under right now because they are not yet in manufacturing. So you have to put a lot of money in to get the factories going here. And without that, I don't know if they will be generating any revenue by July. So they are in trouble. But we've been here before. Everyone remember the Ouya? In many ways, this one executed a lot better than the Intellivision has executed so far, primarily because they kept to a very simple design. They had an Android-based device. It was built around a uh, Tegra chip from NVIDIA. For the time, I think they had the most successful Kickstarter campaign ever. They raised over $8.5 million and had 63,000 backers. On top of that, they were able to hit a very reasonable price point that was about a third of what the other major consoles were selling for at the time. They were selling these things in retail stores, including Amazon, for a hundred bucks. It was as good as you can get if you were trying to disrupt the market or take a small portion of the video game market, but they couldn't survive. They could not sell the software, which was key to all of it. And I think the issue here is, is back what we talked about earlier, which is that these other consoles, even though they were more expensive, had a much larger user base. And it was really hard for Ouya to convince developers to come to their platform, either with a port or with an exclusive, just because even with all their success on Kickstarter, 75,000 installed units is nothing compared to the millions of installed units that Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo had at the time. And it wasn't just these little startups that had issues. Amazon tried to get into the gaming market with their Fire TV. They released a fairly powerful gaming device that was running Fire TV. It was more powerful at that moment than most of the other set-top Android TV boxes at the time. They bundled the controller with it. They got exclusive content, including Shovel Knight, which I think is still exclusive to Fire TV as of the time of this video. Uh, but even Amazon couldn't get going. And of course, we see games as like an afterthought on the Fire TV platform. They do some game streaming stuff through Luna. But for the most part here, the Fire TV as a gaming console is not what they're marketing this system as any longer. Even NVIDIA couldn't make it happen with their own game console. They launched the NVIDIA Shield in 2015. When it was released, it came with a game controller. They were trying to turn this thing into a console with games that played natively on it. If you look at their initial press release from 2015, they have broad developer support as a key focus area of this announcement, quoting studios like id Software, Capcom, and CD Projekt Red. But as we all know, not many native games came to the shield because there wasn't enough of them sold to really get these developers eager to invest time and money to start porting software over to it. And of course, the X1, while powerful, was not as powerful as the Playstations and the uh, Xboxes that were popular at the time of its release. And if you look at the NVIDIA Shield's homepage today, it's a very different marketing strategy here, isn't it? It's based on watching television with remote controls that look like TV remotes and not game controllers. And they're talking about Dolby Vision and Atmos support for home theater and upscaling for old videos to make them look sharper on your 4K TV. Gaming is part of it, but it's through GeForce Now, which is a PC gaming platform that lives in the cloud. There's no porting costs involved with GeForce Now for the developers. Their PC games just run on GeForce Now if they choose to allow them to. And then, of course, you've got the Google Assistant baked into it as well. This is a great Android TV box, the best ever made, the most powerful to this day. It hasn't been uh, eclipsed yet in seven years, but here we are. We're not seeing a lot of development here from NVIDIA on making their own game console. However, uh, what did work out for NVIDIA was that they took the guts of the shield and they worked with Nintendo to create the Nintendo Switch, which has sold 103 million units. So it's worked out okay for NVIDIA in the end. And the reason why it worked for Nintendo and not for NVIDIA is that Nintendo has a vast reservoir of IP that they own exclusively. Mario and Luigi and Kirby and Pikmin and Zelda and all the other games that Nintendo has exclusive to their properties 
are things that exist nowhere else. And on top of that valuable intellectual property, Nintendo has a pool of developers who are extremely talented who can bring this stuff to life and make really fun games. And that's a very important component here. Nobody else has it, and that's why Nintendo sold 103 million units. And even though NVIDIA's effort failed, I think they did pretty well in the end by partnering up with Nintendo with the X1 chip. And if you look at the PlayStation and Sony, it's a very similar story. They've got a large user base, they have a lot of content that's exclusive to the PlayStation platform, and they've built up a very loyal and large user base since they launched their first console in 1995. And when they first got started, they invested hundreds of millions of dollars, more so I think than any video game company had done before them, to market their systems and get a foothold in the market so they could build from something. And certainly that's paid off over the decades here and Sony remains a very successful platform. And then of course you have Sony's big competitor, Microsoft and their Xbox division. They've been firing on all cylinders lately, right? They've acquired Bethesda and Activision. And why did they do that? To build up the base of software that they can make exclusive to their platform. And what's interesting about Microsoft is that they're really building a platform that to some degree is hardware agnostic because if you sign up for Game Pass, you can run the games on your PC, you can stream them to your mobile device. Microsoft doesn't really care at this point so long as you maintain that subscription fee to their service. And I think that's the model that Microsoft is looking at here. But it all comes back to the software and the library. And this is what all of these startup consoles have been missing, which is the exclusivity and the depth of the game library. And if we look at the cost of the Amico versus some of the other consoles we just talked about, it's a lot of money here comparatively. So for example, you can get a Switch Lite, I think, for $199. The one you plug into your TV is only $50 more at $299. The Xbox Series S and its vast library is $299 at the moment. So this is a really expensive device for not a lot of added value, in my opinion. This is something that I think had to get in around the $99 price point to be attractive to the market they're trying to go after, which is families. And unfortunately, we saw with the Ouya, that didn't quite work out even at that price point. And they're even warning that the price might go up if they are able to get this thing into production. So the pre-orders will ship at that $249, but others might cost as much as an Xbox, and I think it's a really hard sell at that price. Now, believe it or not, Intellivision is not the only company going after this small sliver of the gaming market. Their rival from the 80s, Atari, is out there with their own console that costs about $300. This is the Atari VCS. Unlike the Intellivision, you can actually buy this right now if you want one. It's at Best Buy. There's a couple of different configurations which will vary the price a bit, but it works. It's a mini PC with an AMD processor. It runs Atari's own version of Linux with a launcher for the games that it includes, but you can also install Windows or Linux on it for your own stuff if you want. A little pricey for a mini PC given its performance, but they managed to get it out the door and get it into retail shops, and I am sure it's not selling very well. But Atari is more than just this hardware. They have a games division. They have a lot of IP that they can license, and for some reason, blockchain as well. Apparently, they made $400,000 in NFTs last year, according to their financial statement. But they have stuff. They've got IP. They have games. They've been making modern versions of their old games, like uh, Missile Command and Yara's Revenge and Star Raiders. Uh, these are on major platforms like the Xbox and Nintendo Switch. They have their compilations of emulated Atari 2600 games. I didn't realize how much IP they owned until I started digging around on their website. They have a PDF that you can download of all the different things that you can license from them in addition to some of the newer games they're making based on the IP that they own. And on top of that, you'll note that the games they are making are not being limited to their console. They are releasing them across all the major consoles in the Switch because they know if they made it exclusive to the VCS, they'd lose their shirts here. So they put it out on everything. So you're not going to see anything exclusive to the VCS that Atari uh, can't afford to risk losing development dollars on. 
And I think this is telling about how hard it is to launch hardware in this marketplace. They will make more selling those games on Nintendo Switch for three bucks a piece than they will selling hardware for $300 a piece. And if we look at Atari's most recent financial statement, they are a publicly traded company in Europe. Uh, they have posted a loss of 2.8 million euros for the first half of their fiscal year. And they also noted that the Atari VCS represented 2.3 million euros in sales, but it did not contribute to their revenue. And the reason is, is that they've probably got a lot more in hardware development costs that they have to make up before this thing starts turning a profit. I don't think they ever will turn a profit on it, but at least they have a cushion of a solid base of software IP that they can derive revenue from. And that's something Intellivision doesn't have at all. And then, of course, we've got the Oculus Quest, which is now called the MetaQuest. This is a standalone VR headset. It sold very well over the holiday season. Facebook reported $877 million in hardware and software sales. That sounds pretty good, right? Well, guess how much they lost over that same period of time? $3.3 billion. It is really hard to break into this market. You can go to space now for less money than it costs to try to get a console to market here. So any one of these companies that claims it can create a console just from crowdfunding and make it work in the marketplace is crazy. This is a really hard problem to solve unless you've got a compelling new piece of hardware and a ton of unique and special IP to match with it you're going to really struggle. And Facebook has both of those things. They can't make any money doing it here either. So you can see just how hard it is to launch a game console. I think if you've got somebody coming up to you with a pre-order opportunity or an investment opportunity on a new piece of gaming hardware, run. Take that money and invest it in a talented gaming developer, and I think you're going to do much better. The scale of this industry and what you need to be able to do to be competitive in it, I think is beyond what our brains can comprehend at this point. And it's a market that I think is very difficult, if not impossible, to break into with just a crowdfunding campaign. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you, and I wanna thank a super chatter, Mark Bollinger, for his contribution during one of my live streams last week. We also have new supporters on the channel who became YouTube members. They are Silvio Paghi and Jeffrey Smith. I want to thank everyone for their contributions to the channel this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. If you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. That link will take you to my donor box page, which is the best place to go, but we also support the YouTube membership program, Patreon, and Floatplane. You can find me on my other channels as well, including my extras channel for supplementary content, mini reviews, and other stuff. And we also have my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop, where you can watch many of my reviews and live streams ad free. If you want to engage with the channel, we have my very infrequent email list, we have a growing Facebook group and Discord that you can check out. And then we have my store where I sell previously reviewed items at prices lower than new, but there's only one of everything because it's the actual item that appeared here on the desk. And if you want to get notified every time I add something to the store, I have an email list that you can subscribe to and I send out an email every time something gets added to it. And I was able to get rid of two things this weekend and I've got a few more that I'll be adding on throughout the next two weeks or so. So subscribe and you will get notified when I add something there. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you as always for tuning in and for your continued viewership and feedback. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht. Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel. Brian Parker and Frank Goldman. Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya. And Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.